I think a lot of what's driving Putin um, and Russian foreign policy as a result is this desire to have the sphere of influence, but even more than that, to have Russia whole again. Ukraine is really seen as the historical heart of ancient Russia and now modern Russia. Hello and welcome to the G Zero World Podcast. This is where you'll find extended versions of my interviews on public television. I'm Ian Bremmer, and today we look at President Joe Biden's biggest foreign policy challenge yet, Ukraine. Russia has amassed roughly 100,000 troops along the border. They're still expanding. They've ramped up their cyber attacks on Kiev, and they've announced joint military exercises in nearby Belarus. Though the Biden administration has been trying to build a more stable and predictable relationship with Moscow, U.S.-Russia relations are right now on a knife edge. But will Putin invade? Or is this just a high stakes game of political chess? I speak with Alina Polyakova. She's president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis. And she thinks that NATO countries need to get on the same page if they're gonna stand a chance against Putin. Let's get to it. The G Zero World podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, understands the value of service, safety, and stability in today's uncertain world. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. G Zero World would also like to share a message from our friends at Foreign Policy. How can sports change the world for the better? On The Long Game, a co-production of Foreign Policy and Doha Debates, hear stories of courage and conviction, both on and off the field, directly from athletes themselves. Ibtihaj Muhammad, Olympic medalist and global change agent, hosts The Long Game. Hear new episodes every week on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Alina Polyakova, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Maybe start with the impossible question. What do you think Putin is thinking right now? Well, I think anybody that tells you that they know what's going on in Putin's uh, likely somewhat demented mind these days uh, doesn't know what's really going on. You know, I think we can look at the facts on the ground to assess what might, might be going on in his head. And what we see on the ground is that he's slowly positioning forces to really close a noose around Ukraine from the north and from the east and from the south. So I think what that signals to me is that he's thinking about an invasion in, in the very near term. It's clear that Putin is displaying an enormous amount of pressure um, on the Ukrainians and wants to display to the rest of the world that he should be taken seriously. Um, does that equate to you? into uh, invasion is likely? Or does that equate to you to invasion is something he wants to display and it's possible? You know, I think a couple of weeks ago, I was uh, very much on the skeptical side that what the Kremlin was really planning, what Putin really wanted was to you know, deploy a huge amount of resources uh, against a country which you know, is already very much under Russia's thumbs in many ways. You know, Russia still occupies Crimea. Um, it has forces, Russian military forces in the in Ukraine's east in the Donbas. So it, it seemed as a, it seemed a little unclear as to why now, uh, why use up all these resources uh, at a relatively tenuous time. It seems for Russia, the economic situation isn't great. Obviously, the pandemic situation is ongoing. So why? Uh, but you know, unfortunately, I think the the signals we've seen from Russia over the last month and certainly the last several days, I think are very much pointing in direction that they have made a decision. And a decision, I frankly, from a strategic perspective, doesn't make a lot of sense uh, to use those forces and to do something quite aggressive on the military side against Ukraine. And the points that you would make that, are, that most convince you of that? I think a couple of things. One, when the US tried to have this very expansive diplomatic conversation with the Russian side, uh, we didn't see much give. You know, the U.S. came to the table in a series of discussions with the Russian counterparts, with NATO, at the OSCE, uh, and had some real proposals. And the Russian interlocutors that Putin sent obviously had no room 
to negotiate or to even put anything useful on the table. And then when they went back uh, to give the readout to the man who's going to make the decision, what we heard was just much more uh, aggressive tactics, aggressive language. And they basically have uh, walked themselves into a corner. They made really unrealistic demands, which signals to me they weren't interested in diplomacy in the first place. Um, and they really had a plan for more military aggression uh, rather than even trying the diplomatic approach because they didn't get any of their demands met. Uh, but those demands were so unre unrealistic, they must have known that they weren't going to get anything out of it. So before we talk about uh, escalation, maybe one more off-ramp piece that I want to talk about, um, which is when the Russians announced that they had arrested 14 members of the Reval cyber criminal gang and that they had decommissioned that organization, which happened to be on the same day that uh, presumably the Russians engaged in cyber attacks uh, against the Ukrainian government, a number of its institutions. Um, do you think that is coincidence or do you think that reflects some uh, effort by the Russian government um, to provide an opportunity for diplomacy to work? You know, when that happened, my initial thought was this may be a signal of de-escalation. You know, we've been trying to get the Russians to do more uh, to control the cyber criminal groups that are uh, functioning freely inside Russia's borders, um, primarily to Russia's own advantages most of the time. And the Russians have, you know, um, kind of slowed uh, any progress on that. They've done almost nothing. And all of a sudden you have this relatively significant development. Uh, but of course, everything that's happened since then has been signaling in the other direction once again that perhaps this was a coincidence. I mean, maybe at the end of the day, this group got in the Kremlin's nerves and did something that the Kremlin didn't want them to do, and they put the kibosh on it finally. Um, I usually, uh, when people see strategy in something that the Kremlin does, uh, I usually see uh, some, some you know, circumstantial reasons and coincidence. And maybe some incompetence here and there. You know, so I, I think these were two separate events. I don't think the cyber um, you know, uh, arrests uh, of Revol actually were connected to the conversations that are happening in Ukraine. Now, let's talk more about where we're heading from all of this. Uh, talk about how you perceive the European reaction to date, both to what the Russians are up to and also American efforts at coordination. I think the United States has deployed an absolutely Herculean effort on the diplomatic side uh, to always make sure that allies were informed, that there were consultations and coordination uh, happening uh, with European allies with, within the context of NATO, with EU member states, with the UK as well, of course, no longer EU member state. So I think the US has actually done a very good job leading on the diplomatic coordination effort here. I think the other part of your question is really the key here. You know, why is it that when clearly Russia poses the greatest direct threat to Europe, not to the United States, that we have a situation in which the United States is once again having to take lead? It's the U.S. that's expected to send security assistance and military support. It's, again, the United States that has to get, you know, NATO allies, European allies on board. Unfortunately, we've, it's, it's impossible to talk about European position right now uh, because Germany has been sending very mixed messages uh, between the chancellor and the foreign minister who seem to be speaking uh, about two different policies sometimes. Um, and then we have the Baltic the states. The foreign minister taking a much harder line from the Green exactly. Party than the chancellor, yes. Exactly. And then, of course, we have the Baltic states and Poland, which have uh, had very bad experiences back during the Cold War with uh, Soviet occupation, raising alarm bells. And interestingly, the UK really taking that side and doing a lot more um, to raise alarm bells, to provide security assistance. But there is no European position. Europe is very divided. Uh, Germany is a key, key issue here. And this, the new government doesn't seem to have a real strategy or policy in place. So clearly, I mean, the Americans putting a lot of effort in, but some obvious divisions between the U.S. and Europe. NATO has announced that it is sending more forces uh, to Bulgaria, to Romania, to the Baltic states, to the Black Sea. That has included countries like France participating in those moves. And in fact, I think you could argue uh, 
that NATO has, if anything, gotten stronger and more aligned because of the Russian behavior. Now, it seems to me like the one thing that would ensure that NATO is as close-knit and as high morale as possible would be if the Russians engaged in a full invasion against Ukraine. Um, do you agree with that? Well, look, we've seen this movie before in some ways. Uh, you know, when Russia invaded Crimea in 2014 and then uh, launched this hybrid war against uh, Ukraine's east that continues to this day, we really saw NATO united. And we really saw these Russian actions give new life to NATO. You know, NATO has had trouble since the end of the Cold War, really, uh, finding its identity again. And certainly that is no longer the case. And in many things, that's in many things uh, because of Russian renewed aggression in Europe. So of course, what's happening now again is uh, Russia is being a very direct military threat. They're being very escalatory. And that is uniting NATO around a common sense of defense, a common sense of community. And I think that's been a very positive development. I think I always have to ask myself, you know, we think the Russians are so great tacticians, maybe even great strategists, and they keep running circles around us and setting the agenda and forcing the United States and, and NATO to constantly respond to them versus the other way around. But I have to wonder, you know, what's, what's their real strategy here? You know, if they're so worried as they say they are about U.S. troops, NATO troops um, in places like Poland, in Central Eastern Europe more broadly, you know, this isn't helping them. If anything, it's having the opposite effect where they're going to have a much more uh, assertive NATO posture in NATO member states that are closest to Russia. And of course, now we're, we've heard the U.S. administration is considering sending potentially 5,000 more U.S. troops to that part of NATO as well. We could see Russia as committing a serious strategic miscalculation here. But I also think we may want to acknowledge that they're willing to accept those risks, you know, because Ukraine is so important to them that they're willing to accept a reality in which they have all the things they say they don't want um, in Central Eastern Europe as long as they get Ukraine. Because, of course, it's not just a question of NATO being united, but the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian government is much more anti-Russian today than it was in 2014 because of the steps that the Russians took. And that continues apace today. And, and I, I sort of wonder, what is the Russian endgame here? I understand why they would want to get rid of Zelensky, the Ukrainian president. Putin thought he was going to be able to work more effectively with, and he can't. I absolutely see why the Russian government would say, let's just get rid of this guy. But that's very different from, we want to have control over Ukraine. I don't know how you get from here to there. I think there's a couple of things at play here. One, um, you know, Ukraine as a, a country is an incredibly emotional issue, not just for Putin, but for many Russians. You know, there's a vision of the, the Russian world um, that many, certainly in the Kremlin and Russian officials subscribe to, that isn't limited to Russia's political borders. It goes far beyond that. It's Belarus, it's Ukraine. Um, and really, Ukraine is really seen as the historical heart of, of ancient Russia, not modern Russia. And I think Putin, looking at probably his legacy as really the maker of modern Russia at this point after you know, more than 20 years in power, you know, sees that he cannot leave a legacy in which Russia doesn't regain some of that territorial imperial vision of itself. Um, and I think there's a few things at play here that are not you know, rational in that sense of the world or strategic from a military sense. I think a lot of what's driving Putin um, and Russian foreign policy as a result is this desire to have the sphere of influence, but even more than that, to have Russia whole again. That is how Russian political analysts and Russian state-controlled television talk about Ukraine as a part of Russia. And I think when we see it from that perspective, the risks they're willing to take um, in this potential invasion uh, make a little bit more sense in some ways when we don't see this as a complete military strategy, but really something that Putin sees as part of his legacy and the future of Russia. To the extent that you say that this is not just about national security, but it's also making Russia whole again, then I wonder if that makes it less of a threat to the United States, to the Europeans, none of whom are considered to be 
part of the Russian nation for Moscow. And let's this isn't China, where they've been growing, growing, growing over the last couple of decades and are going to be the largest economy in the world. I mean, the Russian economy is smaller than the Canadian economy right now. They got a lot of nukes and they're, they're willing to take some risks. But I mean, in reality, when pre former President Obama called them a regional power, I mean, I wish he hadn't said that publicly, but they're kind of a regional power. I mean, should, should that thinking at least be part of the discussions that the Americans and the NATO allies are having when they think about how to respond to this Ukraine crisis? You know, I, I think that's the million dollar question there, because at the end of the day, the way I would answer this is to say that what's happening today in Ukraine isn't just about Ukraine. And we cannot assume, let's say in a terrible hypothetical scenario, you know, we just say, okay, we're not going to get involved. Our priority is China and the Indo-Pacific. Let's shore up NATO and the security of NATO member states and Ukraine, Belarus, okay, what can we do? We're not going to expand all of our resources to protect these countries that are not NATO members at the end of the day. Which functionally has been the NATO response on Belarus so far. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. But, you know, Ukraine is a democracy that wants to be part of Euro-Atlantic institutions. And Belarus is a dictatorship, at least with a regime that doesn't want to be part of Euro-Atlantic institutions. So there is a difference there. The Ukrainians want to be part of NATO. They want to be part of the EU. Um, this is the path the Ukrainian people want for themselves. And this is what Putin is trying to prevent. But again, going back to my hypothetical reality, you know, we can't assume that once Russia gets a taste and senses that weakness in the West, which they're sensing right now, that they will stop. Because then we have the Southern Caucasus, we have Georgia, we have Armenia, we have Azerbaijan. You know, you could easily see Russian rhetoric shift and suddenly say, well, we're not really talking about just Ukraine and Belarus. It's about the former Soviet states. Why not? You know, that was Soviet territory. Uh, the entire East Bloc, Poland, the Baltic states, etc. cetera. Uh, so we can't assume that if we quote unquote, give them Ukraine, uh, that that's going to be satisfying for them for the long term. I don't think it will be. That kind of appeasement never works. Putin has of course said that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was the greatest uh, exactly. geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century in his view. Um, about about as antithetical from the American perspective on geopolitics as one could make in terms of a statement. Um, yeah. one, one thing, of course, Alina, we have not spoken about so far is Ukraine. <laughs> We've spoken around Ukraine. We haven't spoken about Ukraine. The Ukrainian government, uh, no, virtually no support inside NATO for allowing them to actually join NATO. A lot of support right. to provide them with military uh, weapons. Um, there's been a lot of challenges in terms of that governance itself. Um, Zelensky's popularity has shrunk down to the 30s at this point, despite um, that you'd think with the common threat that he'd be, you know, sort of seen as more of a wartime president. That's not the case. Um, how much do you think uh, the West should be betting on him in terms of his ability uh, to be a useful mm -hmm. interlocutor uh, with NATO countries? Look, I mean, Zelensky came into office with no political experience. Let's remember Zero. who he is. Yeah. Yeah. He was a, a TV star and a, and a well-known comedian and really won because he had name recognition in the country yeah. for playing a president on TV, right? So let's just remember who he is. Um, look, at the end of the day, we have to bet on Ukraine. You know, in, in countries like Ukraine, there are such new democracies. We can't forget how really new and fragile Ukraine's democracy is. It hasn't had... 200 years to develop. Um, it's really had about 30, you know? Um, it's, it's a country that is still finding out what it means to be a democracy. And, we, and despite Zelensky's inexperience of, as a political leader, he did win a huge landslide. So he is the legitimate leader. He's not popular, but not many <laughs> leaders are. Look at Macron's numbers sometimes, look at President Biden's numbers these days, right? Um, I think we have to bet on Ukraine and we have to work with the government that's in place. And absolutely, you're right. You know, when the Russians say uh, we're, that they were really worried about Ukraine joining NATO, this is a complete falsehood. There was no avenue for Ukraine to join NATO anytime soon, as you, as you rightfully said. So we have to bet on Ukraine. And I think we have to bet on Ukraine developing as a democracy in the years ahead, with, whether that's with Zelensky or another democratically elected president, 
President, that should be our goal, to make sure it is a democracy in this part of the world that's increasingly surrounded by authoritarian states like Belarus and Russia. Alina Pralikova, thanks for joining us on GZR World. My pleasure. That's it for today's edition of the G-Zero World Podcast. Like what you've heard? Come check us out at gzeromedia.com and sign up for our newsletter, Signal. The G-Zero World Podcast is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, understands the value of service, safety, and stability in today's uncertain world. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. GZero World would also like to share a message from our friends at Foreign Policy. How can sports change the world for the better? On The Long Game, a co-production of Foreign Policy and Doha Debates, hear stories of courage and conviction, both on and off the field, directly from athletes themselves. Ibtihaj Muhammad, Olympic medalist and global change agent, hosts The Long Game. Hear new episodes every week on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to the G-Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of GZero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, GZero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.